have a sermon that I had prepared that I was going to preach. And um, I had one of those moments on the front row a second ago where God began to speak to me to share with you what I don't know as a sermon. I don't know what I'm going to preach. Um, that's a weird spot to be in because there's a lot of people wondering, what are you going to say? How many of y'all are pretty sure that I'm not going to laugh for anything to say? Even without the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't laugh for anything to say. But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit already drops this stuff in my heart. And by the end of this tonight, you're going to have mental clarity. And you're going to understand where it is you need to go. And you're going to know where the ball needs to go. Like, what's the goal? Where, where are we at? So first we're going to go to Isaiah 61 and multimedia Good luck staying with me. Actually, I shouldn't say good luck because I don't believe it. Luck comes from the word Lucifer, and we don't believe in that around here. In Florida, by the way, congratulations. When I'm looking at you right now, I can't believe how packed out that place is. And it was raining to beat the band, and you guys made it. Come on, Royal Palm Beach in the house. So pretty. Actually, Ryan, he's so pretty. He was Jesus on the cross, and he, he was texting me. I'm praying for you, PD. And I appreciate that. Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. And he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. That would be my text. I want to talk about going through a broken heart. I know what it's like to have a broken heart. I know what it's like to love somebody more than they love you. I know what it's like to uh, have somebody that you really love walk away. And no matter how much money that you have, money won't fix it. Now, if I am brokenhearted, I'd rather have money than be broke and brokenhearted. (laughs) Because you can look for happiness in a convertible. Can I get an amen? So if you got a choice, go with that. But I'm just telling you, it won't fix it. Jesus said, through the prophet Isaiah, he is prophesying, foretelling what Jesus would be to you. Now, Jesus isn't going to heal your heart because you were good. And chances are, you know you did wrong. And you know in this scenario, in this situation, that You had a lot to play in it. Please give me that camera. And so while you are doing this thing called life, you've got a lot of guilt because you know you shouldn't have said that. And if you could go back, you would not have sent the email. If you went back, you wouldn't have sent the text. If you went back, but we can't go back. But we can go forward asking God to heal us and asking God to heal the relationship. So in my case, I'm going to give you a few scenarios. I got married when I was 18, and I loved that girl. And, um, and I think she loved me, but not the way I loved her. And that's a horrible spot to be in. And we got married, and we made it work, but it was just a struggle the whole time. I would say this as a dad to you, because I'm 48, and I know what you're thinking. You don't look a day over 47. Thanks for saying that. (laughs) But uh, as a dad talking to you, and I might even be younger than you, but I might be a, a father figure in your life. I would say be careful trying to make love work. Like, you know, we're gonna make it work. If we get counseling, we'll make it work. I mean... I don't like that. I think that you're going to discover through time that if you're not very, very compatible and you're living on love and love is blind for you, then chances are marriage will be a real eye-opener for you. And then in time, it'll be worse than you expected, just as a dad. Now, I realize you may never listen to me and you'll go through the pain I went through, but I'm telling you, man, it hurts. I remember living in... 
she's coming, she's going, she's coming, she's going, she's leaving, she's coming back. And I remember that this is a good person too. I, I want you to know, some of you might know this girl. He, you know, she surfaces, she lives in this town. She's a good person. But we weren't supposed to be together. This was man-made. And what man has to make, man has to try to sustain. So I have a saying here at churches that we build in Royal Palm Beach as well. What you build, you must maintain. And be careful. If you ever get rich, be careful because what you want to do is keep up with the Joneses. And so you want a bigger pool and you want a bigger house and you want a bigger barn. And I've done all that. And then all of a sudden you become a caretaker. Even though you can afford to have people do it, now you're kind of tied. How many jet ski batteries do you want to tenderize? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, good for you. But it all boils down to are you going to be happy? Can you sleep at night? Do you love this person? Because there's going to be a point to where God brings a person into your life, and you're going to love them more than life itself. And if you've ever had a baby, you know what I'm talking about. You never knew you could love something like that. When Ashley was born, I never thought I could fall in love with a bald-headed, toothless, toothless woman. <laughs> but I did. I know, told Nicole I wouldn't go into the zoo. I wasn't that kind of guy. I ride motorcycles. She's not going to impair my life. And then all of a sudden, I took her everywhere, and I don't like doing life without her. And her name is tattooed on my arm, and, and her, my daughter in love is t tattooed on my arm and my son. Because what really matters to me is I went through hell alone with somebody that didn't love me like I loved them. And if somebody ever loves you, be loyal to them. Be a knight in shining armor to them. Be honorable to them. And you're going to do enough screwed up stuff on your own to make their life miserable. At least love them back the way they love you. Because at the end of the day, all that really matters is you, and not you alone being happy, but you being with somebody that is a companion to you. And that might even look like the church for you. Talking about getting over broken heart. So I went through that scenario and thought I'd never love again. So then I started eating, self-sabotaging. And then there was this piano player at my daddy's church who was, uh, he was always telling me, you're going to live again, you're going to love again, you're going to be happy again. And I was like, shut up. Anybody ever met a Christian person that was way too Christianese? And this cat was saved. And, and with all due respect, he's an amazing man. But I really didn't even want to hear it. Anybody want to slap a Christian? Come on, somebody like, <laughs> shut up. It's easy for you to say your life is perfect because you just quote scriptures and hallelujah, praise the Lord. You've never done anything wrong. I'm jacked up. I deserve to be in this situation because I'm a bad man. <laughs> and um, eventually one day, that scripture came alive to me that the spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. And he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And to, claim it, to proclaim liberty to those that are captive and open the prison to those who are bound. And um, I decided what I was going to do, and I want to encourage you to do this, is to just take charge of your life where you're at right now. If you're hurting, don't hurt alone. Go to church. That's typically what we do is we pray jailhouse prayers, and we go to church, and then we normalize, and then we get our life back together, and then we kind of, in a... And, and not necessarily even in an intentional way, we go ahead and hose God again. And God's standing there going, well, I'll be waiting when you need me again. And he's so loving, he's so kind. He'll always be there for you. Thank God we have a revelation to this church that we don't get what we deserve. Amen. We get what Jesus deserved. And he loved us so much that he's gonna help us through this difficult time right now, even if we're the ones who screwed it up. And so, you know, I, I start, you know, living life again, and I stop abusing food. In other words, what I did is before I was just eating ice cream like crazy, and I didn't even worry about, like, I'm going to get more steps by, this is before an iPhone where it counted your steps, and so it didn't matter to me. So I would go to the refrigerator and get the, the half gallon of ice cream, and then I didn't even worry about, like, I'm going to put it in a bowl. Like, I'm alone. It doesn't matter. It's me and my cat. It's just going to be roll up my sleeve, stick my hand in it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you ever had chocolate all over you, you didn't even care. I was watching my stories. <laughs> and then one day, I decided 
I'm going to have to get my life together. I'm going to have to go back to my dad's house. And even though my dad told me not to marry her, I went back to church and I started walking and, and drinking loads of water. Not nobody, I didn't know Don Strange or any health people. I knew nothing about this. But come to find out, if you drink a lot of water, you have to pee a lot, so you walk a lot <laughs> and you lose weight. Can I get an amen? Yeah. And so I started feeling better. I'm hydrated. And then I started going out and I met some people. And these weren't even the best people, to tell you the truth. I mean, they were good people, but they were sinners. And, uh, but at the time, I was, I was enjoying sin. And it was a friend, and carbs and a friend were, they helped me through some times. Can I be honest with you? So carbs helped me a lot of time. They were there for me in the midnight hour. <laughs> and so were these people that I wasn't necessarily doing the right thing with because I was hurting. By the way, when people are going through a divorce or a hard time, please don't judge them for 12 to 24 months because within those 12 to 24 months, you got rejected, you're hurt, so you might dress a little weird, you might try to get some attention, you might do some stupid stuff. But until you've lived through 12 to 24 months of hell, I don't judge people, nor will I write a book about how to raise perfect children until we see how Ashton turns out. So far, so good. I'm proud of her. Am I making sense to you? So while you're walking through these scenarios, don't be judgmental towards other people because you might find yourself where I found myself many times, where the thing I said I'd never do, I did. And then in the midst of this mess, God leads me to Nicole. And I meet a girl, and, and to be truthful, just I'll just tell you, is what it is, I saw her and I thought she's beautiful. I mean, I'm, I'm not, um, I've just was, a, I've always been attracted to pretty girls. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, can I get an amen? And it's just, I mean, <laughs> I've never seen a really ugly woman and thought, man, I wanna ask her out. It just, I'm not saying that there's somebody for everybody, okay? And by the way, I was just kind of kidding there. Beauty is only skin deep. And sometimes the prettiest people can be the meanest people. And you ought to give everybody a shot. That was just unnecessary to, to try to get attention. And this obviously was a sermon that has not been rehearsed or ever preached before. It may never be preached again. <laughs> but at least laughter helps. So I'm eating a coal. Ask her out, no, ask her out, no, because she had been abused. And here's the interesting thing about abused women, and there are a lot of them, and we're gonna do more to help them. Women want to trust a man, but if they've been hurt and violated by men or always sized up by men, then you tend to alienate men. So Nicole's hurt. She eventually goes out with me, and uh, first date, there was such chemistry between us, and. And that's when she asked me to marry her. And I was like, I don't know. I'm rushing into this. <laughs> that part's not true. <laughs> but, but what was happening was that God was doing something, and I didn't even know God was doing it. It was just a girl I was going to go out with. I didn't know that in the midst of even some of my sin with some other girl who introduced me to her, that God was going to take our lives, which were horrible sinners, and put me in the ministry, and put her in the ministry. I didn't know it. And I'm kind of glad I didn't know it, because I would be scared. I'd be like, oh my God, I want to screw this up. <laughs> Neither one of us knew who we would be. But now, let's fast forward. She has a son who's there, who's my son, and whom I'm well pleased, and I, I love him, I would die for him, he's phenomenal. And he had a lot of pain he had to get over. And the, 
Nicole had a lot of pain she had to get over. Now let's fast forward, okay? Now we get married. And she's making good money. She told me right away the first month we were getting ready to get married that she made $100,000 a month most of the time. And you heard me joke. That's when I said, I love you. And it's not because of just, I just love you. I do not believe in prenuptials because it's a good way to fail a marriage. We go into this and whatever I have is yours and whatever you have <laughs> is mine. Seems smart at the time. And I remember one day we were doing good. And then um, we were kind of jogging together, this little country road by this house, and I, we were kind of in a fight. We like to call it now intense times of fellowship. Because <laughs> it sounds better, doesn't it? But, but we were in a fight, and, and I said my ex-wife's name to her. I said, well, so-and-so, and that set her off. That's why now I, I tattooed her name into my arm so I can always be here. Nicole? But Titus, I, um, she took off running back to the house. And she's got a 34-inch inseam. <laughs> and I tried to catch her, but I couldn't. She was gone. But then when I went back to talk to her, she was so mad and she was so angry. And it really wasn't about that. It was about all the stuff prior to me, and all of that comes out real quick. So, you know, Nicole was short with me there, and, and rightfully so, you shouldn't do that, but I mean, if you were married to somebody for, you were somebody for 10 years, that could happen. And um, we worked through that. Well, my point is, is that sometimes when you marry somebody, they're going to have some baggage. And it's going to take time. Thank God Nicole was patient, and we worked through that. And obviously, the good news is, how many of y'all know how it's, it ended? I mean, we stayed together. You're like, what happened? <laughs> well, hey, you brainiac, it worked out. Come on, somebody. <laughs> She's here. Give it up for Nicole. She's a great woman of God. <laughs> so my point is, is that God uses people sometimes to... mend our broken heart. But you have to have the patience to not be so short that you run out in the flesh and think that this person, whether you stay married to them or not, or you date them or not, or you get married to them or not, or you stay in business with them or not, you can't think that this person's going to change overnight. A lot of people have a lot of reasons why they're acting the way they're acting. But will you be patient enough? To give them space. I had a lot of things I had to be patient. Nicole had to be patient with me about. And vice versa. Because she was an abused and abnormally used woman. One time I moved my hand just for a second. She said, you're not going to hit me. And I was like, I've never hit a woman in my life. Nor would I because I'm not sure I would win. You got a lot of fire in you. Your arms are kind of long. You work out. Have, have you ever seen her preach? And you're like, oh my gosh. She's ripped. If I'm going to fight somebody, it's not going to be you. <laughs> but why did she do that? Because she had been hurt by somebody else. So sometimes the people that you love, you got to be patient with them. Have you ever hurt a part of your body and all of a sudden you re-injured it really quick? Well, the same is true with people's emotions. And so God might be bringing you into the church right now or you're drawing near to God right now in a, in a big way. And the reason why is that God's drawn you here tonight with his love to say, hey, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted. So just this message tonight can do more for you than a counselor. And I'm all for Christian counselors and it's great. I mean, all for anything that helps you and makes you happy. But I'm telling you what is happening right now is God is healing your heart. And a couple of things you have to do is realize no matter who you marry, or who you date, or who you get in business with, people are going to hurt you. So sometimes, here's dad talking again. It's good just to tell people, and I did it today in staff meeting. Ryan Potter, come here. 
Ryan was in staff meeting. I see many staff members here. And I stood on this stage today and streamed to Florida today. And, come here, Ryan. And uh, I said this to them. Ryan, Josh, Adrian, Phil, Nolan, I want to let you guys know that this is my first time being a leader. I don't know what I'm doing, but I know sometimes I don't do it right. But will you forgive me if I ever do it wrong? Because I know I do. I'm sorry. Because if I offend you and you can't do your ministry and what you do for this church, man, I can't sleep at night knowing that I did that to you. So I want to let you know that I'm proud of you guys. And I know that I know that I know that you love me. And that you don't have to get me a card to say that you love me. I know that you love me. So I know sometimes when you guys fail, and you do, and I see it. That you didn't do it on purpose. That you just didn't know how to do it. So don't think that you can't win. Or don't think that you're not cut out for it. And that makes guys like Ryan. Or Austin. Or MJ in Florida. Or Radiance. Or Tim. And all our team in Florida. Who's given their lives to doing this. Loading in and loading out. Every Sunday morning. Setting up what is their offices during the day. And making a church out of it at nighttime. How could this be that... They would do this. They do it because they love you. So here's my point to you. If you love somebody, don't let the sun go down tonight without telling them you're wrong, you're sorry. What can I do better? And no matter what, know that I love you and I'm going to stay with you forever. And you can't ever, ever change that no matter what. Because if you leave, I'm going with you. Come on, somebody ought to give God praise tonight. Because we have to be the people who heal the brokenhearted. We have to... Bring the recovery of the sight to the blind. So Nicole was blind that there was a guy, there was a good guy that would love her. So for you to say that all men are bad or all women are bad or all this ethnicity is bad or this person is bad, you don't know why that person acts that way. But when they share your heart, they share their heart with you. It makes you love them more. Raise your hand if it's making sense to you right now. So, um... In Florida, Angie, right next to you right now is a a lady named Cynthia who's wearing that beautiful teal top. And Cynthia came up to me Sunday at the church in Florida. She grabbed me. Well, first of all, I was sitting in the front row, Florida. She sat behind me. And I was worshiping God, and Titus was killing it, and the team was killing it, and it was just an anointed moment. And all of a sudden, I put my hand down, and I feel her grab it, and kiss it. I kind of grabbed her hand. And Cynthia, at the end of the church service, Cynthia grabbed me and she said, you know what? I love you. Cynthia had an eating disorder as a child because she was sexually abused by somebody that she loved. And then her dad abused her and fed her dog food. That girl right there, that lady. And she told me that again, two or three people are around, two Catholics, first time ever coming to the church, and they're standing there, and she says, they're saying, I love the church, it's great, I loved it, I watched you on television. He said, 70% of your church is Catholic and Lutheran, so we knew we could come here and not go to hell, and we loved it, and we felt good, and they came, and, and Cynthia tells the story in front of them. She said, you changed my life. I said, no, Cynthia, Jesus changed your life. And she said, yes, I know, but I'm just telling you that Jesus has been around a long time, but I, I was bound until I met you. And I get it. All the glory goes to Jesus, but I'm just telling you that Jesus is going to use you to heal the brokenhearted. Jesus is going to use you, Eric, to heal the brokenhearted. So, why do I do what I do? Because of Cynthia. Why do I want you to be evangelistic? Because of the Cynthia you don't know at the mall that you passed who was going to commit suicide? Why do we need to do more to help people 
Because little Austin was eight years old and his mother was being beaten by a drug addict, not her father, because Nicole never married Austin's dad. That was the thing that happened with a football player. Then she met a guy with all the right initials behind his name. And then he's a drug addict and he beats her in the town of Florissant. And the cops would come and, and rescue her and Austin's crying because he's watching his mom be thrown through the wall and this drug addict's taking his video games and pawning them. You see her on stage and think, wow, isn't she beautiful and probably nothing ever happened to her. She went through hell as a battered woman. But there's a whole lot of battered men and women and we are the church and we're supposed to rescue those people and bring the love of Jesus to them, build buildings. Come on, somebody ought to help me right now and rescue people who might be doing this because they were beaten by their dad, because dad fed them dog food, because Uncle Bob molested them. I'm telling you, we are the church and we are called to heal the brokenhearted. We're supposed to bring recovery of sight to the blind and we're going to do everything in our power to minister the love of Jesus to save Lewis and the Palm Beach and then take it to the whole wide world. Come on, somebody ought to give God praise today. Give me something. I'm almost done. I um I want to go to Luke 19 and I'm just gonna read. Verse 1, it says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus and who Jesus was, but he could not see him because the crowd was so great and he was so short in stature. He was so short in stature. He was rich and he was short. Pay attention. I'm almost done. He was rich and he was short. I say that because here's what I know about rich people. They're short in an area of their life. They've come up short all the time. They feel like they're short with their kids. I make a lot of money and I make them really happy, but I just, I'm short with the kids. They're short with their temper. Every rich person feels short in an area. And most likely they are. Jesus walks through, if you read the passage in All these people are around, and Zacchaeus really wants to see Jesus, but the problem is nobody wants to see him because he's a tax collector, and nobody liked them then, and nobody likes them now. (laughs) And so, but he is smart. So he climbs to the top of the tree. When everybody else is down here just looking at the back of people's heads, he goes, and he is not tall, but he makes himself tall by elevating himself in a tree. Jesus walks, you know the story, he sees him in the tree, and he says, Zach! He freaks out because he can't believe he knows my name. He knows your name. Come down. And in front of everybody, which had to feel really, really good because nobody liked him, Jesus says, today I'm going to your house for lunch. How many of y'all know now he's feeling about 12 foot tall and bulletproof? And um, so I'm going to your house for lunch. He was a sinner. And he goes on to say, um, immediately in front of Jesus, hey, if I've taken anything from anybody, I want to make sure that I restore it. And not only that, I will restore it with interest. And uh, hey, you know what? I want to make this right. Here's what happens when you get right with Jesus. You automatically want to make the things right that are wrong. So if God gave you resources and you have a job, then you want to take the resources you have to make something right that's wrong. Talking about, if you haven't seen the movie Trafficked, you should. I know it's it's bad for a preacher to tell you that because there's some nasty scenes and there's some cussing. and and, uh, But I mean, I see that all the time in our dream team. So it's not a big deal. (laughs) But do you know that there's girls being sex trafficked like crazy right now in America? That some of our senators are being bought off? I have a man in the room right now who is with the CIA that knows all of this. And I know things that you don't know. It's a nasty, corrupt United States of America. And uh, I love it. I love the United States of America. I've been all over the world. I wouldn't trade anything for it, but I'm just telling you. We're not all we're cracked up to be. 
because we've taken God out of school, we've taken God out of the government, and we've taken, everywhere you take God out, you're going to invite the devil in. Come on, somebody ought to give God praise today. Some of y'all thinking it's a political statement. It's not. It is real. And there's a lot of corruption. So we have to use what we have and give it back. So if you have resources, your time, your talent, and your treasure, there is a day in your life, and as you get older, you're going to understand this. You start kind of doing the math on your life. And you realize there's less Christmases left than you really had ever anticipated. And you might only have ten left. You might only have five left. I met a guy today that only has one left. Maybe. So when are you going to ask yourself a question? Am I going to give back? What am I going to do to make the world a better place? What am I going to personally do to reach people for Jesus to make a difference? Because everybody has pain, and everybody's looking for somebody to say, I know your name. People need to be known and needed. Write that down if you take it down. They need to be known and needed. Known and needed. There's a guy right now, um, I see him back there in the back. Forget his name, but I always call him like uh, he wears cool glasses and he owns a bunch of rental properties and, and um, Austin would know his name. And, but I'm sorry, I don't know his name. But he's a very good looking guy, tall and cool. He reminds me a lot of myself, I tell you. I just, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I was at the mall in, in, in uh, Royal Palm Beach and I was walking through the mall, I looked at some shoes. This really good looking Spanish guy, real lean. Tight little suit, sales guy, no socks on, cool shoes. Says, Pastor David. Yeah, how you doing? Says his name. He said, you know me? He said, I, I saw you one day when you were with one of my heroes, a, a baseball player. You guys were out hanging out. And I forget his name, your buddy, the baseball St. Louis legend. Oh, Keith, Hernandez. Keith Hernandez. So me and Nicole and Keith Hernandez were friends with People, and I can't remember their name, obviously. We know about my challenges with names. <laughs> we spent a lot of holidays with Keith and so on, and he's a St. Louis Cardinal legend, and I know nothing about sports, so he never impressed me other than I did see him on uh, Seinfeld in a, a rerun, and I thought, oh, my gosh, I know that guy. <laughs> that is a kicking mustache. Come on, somebody. So, so he, he, he knew me from then. He said, I re you remember meeting me then? Blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, I think I do. But he goes, there's a guy at your church, and he said the guy's name who's there in the blue shirt. He said, he's my landlord. He said, he's always inviting me to church. And I said, why don't you come? <laughs> Let's do it. And then Austin came over and hugged him and we talked. But here's what I'm saying. I was so proud of him. Because the Bible says that one plants, another waters, and the Lord gives the increase. So, so this Sunday here at this church, and I'm almost done. Give me one minute. This church in St. Louis, you know, Weldon, Saturday night here, Earth City, Florida. When I'm at the store or I'm somewhere this week, who's going to come up to me and go, hey, I know you. So-and-so goes to your church and they invited me. Then you planted a seed. I watered it, and then the Lord brought the increase. So for you to sit here tonight, or you watching online, or you in Florida, and think that this week is about, well, I can't wait to hear the next sermon that really makes me cry and makes me feel better by Sunday. Please stop that. Please know people's name. Please join a dream team. Please serve in the coffee ministry. There's a lady I met a while ago. She's a military lady. She met through the Copeland Network. If you're not embarrassed, would you raise your hand? The lady I met out in the hallway right before church, and you raise your hand. Are you here? I know you're here, but you're scared to raise your hand. You, could you mosey on down? Maybe somebody can help you. I promise you I won't embarrass you. Because um, oh, I already have. Right? She's walking down, and I'm, I'm ready to close. I was out front and hanging out with some friends. And 
she comes up and she's so excited to meet me. She goes, I saw you with Kenneth Copeland. And uh, you and Nicole have changed my life. And this church has changed my life. And she's going through, come over here, sweetheart. She's going through the whole story and scenario of how this church changed her life. And I enjoyed hearing it. I think you said you brought me a, bought me a hockey puck, right? Yeah. Yes, sir, I did. So she bought me a hockey puck because she said, you and Nicole always put the puck where it needs to be. And you helped me through some difficult times and seasons. And I didn't know her. I don't know anything about her, but I know I love her. And I know there's a whole lot of people like her. And maybe it's you tonight watching and you've been watching online because you're afraid to go to church because you're hiding behind the screen because you feel like, oh man, I'm too fat, I'm too short, I'm too old, I'm, I'm straight, I'm gay, I'm lesbian, I'm abused, I was fed dog food, I was, I was manipulated by men, I've got to hide behind the screen. I'm begging you tonight to come to this church and let us love you back to health, let us get you healthy again, let us rebuke the devil over your life again. Because you might have limped in and you might have some physical ailments or you got something to set you back. I'm telling you, I promise you, nobody's going to judge you at this church and me know about it. They might, but they won't be here long because we just don't like that. I, I told the pastor today, um, I had meetings with two pastors. My worship guy, come here a minute. I had, I had meetings with two pastors this week. One today, one yesterday. African-American brothers in the city, and the Lord told me to reach out to them and love on them. And um, it's kind of interesting talking to those guys and their take on what we do and how we do it and what we're doing. A lot of it, they don't understand what we're doing. Um, but I, the one kind of freaked out when I said, oh, you don't have to worry about us because we don't go for church people. You don't have to worry about us coming to your neighborhood because, like, we don't, we don't do church people. Like, church people don't go to our church. And, huh? Like, for real. Like, they don't know who, uh, you know, a lot of the names are. Like, if I said, for instance, we're having Craig Rochelle, you wouldn't know who they were. You'd know Joel because Joel's another guy who's not really for church people. Subsequently, most church people don't like Joel. Um, <laughs> Well, we love church people. It just wasn't who I was called to help. And um, my point in that is this. I want to make sure you guys stay evangelistic. And I want you to make sure that you notice people. So when I saw him over there, what's your name, buddy? Chris. Chris. So I was watching Chris worship tonight. And, and Chris was so worshiping God. And I looked around the room and I felt ashamed of some of you because you really weren't worshiping God. You were just going through the motions or you were looking at the lights or you were thinking about what you had to do or whatever. And I, I turned to Mary and I said, Mary, she was looking at him going, I said, do you feel like a sinner right now? Like we're not really worshiping God like we should? And she said, yeah. And I said, Mary, if we make it to heaven, we'll see him there. Because he just put his worship on display. Yeah. And so when I looked at Chris, he looked at me and I went, and he was dancing. And, he, yeah. and then he was doing this and I'm like, and he just went more. Yeah. And he was worshiping more and he was worshiping stronger. And he was singing louder. And he just, when I noticed him, it made him like, Petey likes what I'm doing. And I'm going to really do it because he likes what I'm doing. Nobody out worshiped him tonight. Nobody out singing him tonight. Now, there might have been a better singer, but there wasn't a better singer. There might have been a better dancer, but there wasn't a better dancer. This Chris right here is the man. Yeah, can we have a mic? She wants to say something. Good evening. I just passed my first test. I wasn't doing well for a male to touch me.
All right. God, we love you. We yield our lives to you, Jesus. I pray for every person who felt like tonight that I was talking directly to them, that you'll help them through this difficult time of being brokenhearted. God, that you will do for them what you've done for our broken lives, Nicole and I. You will touch them that you will touch our family in West Palm Beach. God, I know some of their stories and some of them I know once you spoke to me to, to do church this way, when they turned the lights on in West Palm and I saw them and I knew the issue that they were going through, I thought, wow, it makes perfect sense because you know everything, God. And God, as they leave to go home in West Palm and are gonna be safe, some of them I know drew for an hour, some two, as a church that lives worth the drive. God, as they did the same thing here, I know my friend that I met today from Troy that drives all the way here from Troy that you're touching him and everyone else, God, as they go home safe. We pray this in the name of Jesus.